Yeah, I make games, and I'm your host, Ms. Ziziz, with co-hosts Brogan Hackett. Hello. And Adam Pipe. Hello. And this week, we're joined by Bria Sullivan, who made Boba Story. So, Bria, what do you do? Uh, yeah, I make games. Today's sponsor is Peter Martingale, also goes by Big Hand in the Sky, who just released a game called A Day of Maintenance. It's a sci-fi truck simulation with queer interactive fiction set in the early 2100s. You drive around a desert of shipwrecks, fixing radar installations and banter with robot bodies on the Earth's surface and have conversations with your boyfriend up in Earth's orbit. You can find the game at an itch link in the description, and it is out now, and there's a playable free demo. Thank you to Peter for sponsoring this episode. So you made boba story which is like a boba tea making game Mm -hmm. that's been doing really well on tiktok and that's kind of where you promoted it mostly was on there what's like the story behind that so i had like never used tiktok prior to using tiktok as a way to get users i with a lot of people who are like millennials it was more like a i don't need another social media thing but I am a solo dev, and this was, like, at the end of 2020, I want to say, like, December time, and I was trying to, like, actually try marketing because marketing isn't, like, my background. My background's in engineering. So I took, like, a Udacity course. It's it's a little bit outdated, but I remember having to – one of the, like, first two weeks assignments was to, like, interview customers and, like, answer certain questions and, like, ask stuff about their day. And so, like, I was just interviewing people that I know liked boba and stuff. And I would ask them what they would do in their day. And then everyone kept saying part of their day was TikTok. And I was like, okay, like, I I guess this is where I should go. And I think a friend of a friend had reached out to me just to, like, give me random advice saying, hey, get on TikTok, like, all within the same week. Um, And I think his friend was a game dev on TikTok and then one of the popular ones. But I didn't know exactly how to do videos yet. And I didn't even know what content to put. (laughs) But my first video, I remember, was just me at my computer. And it was just like, I quit my job at Google to make games, dot, 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 about, dot, 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 bubble tea. (sighs) And then that video ended up getting like 250,000 views. And uh, I was like, whoa. This is crazy. Like, that was my first time, like, even using TikTok. And then, like, the fact Mm -hmm. that every time I mention that I left Google to make games about bubble tea, like, everyone, like, dunks on me. (laughs) Uh, People think, uh, they either think that I'm lying or they love to call me stupid or um, it's, like, I get super cyberbullied every time I mentioned it on, like, any platform. (laughs) (laughs) But it does go viral usually every time I mention it. So uh, on TikTok at least. So <laughs> if I really, really am like desperate for some uh, for some users, then um, I'll sacrifice my mental health for a few weeks. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was like my the beginning, and I was like, "What is going on?" But I was just like trying different things. There were a few game dev TikToks at that time. So this is December 2020. I think everyone who was a game dev would just end up following each other. And one guy who was the friend of a friend of a friend um, ended up like, I just said, hey, and then um, in DM and he gave me just a couple tips in terms of like things to try, but I had to do a lot of trial and error to like figure out what worked. He would show his game, but he would also answer questions like, how do you make a game or like, um, how much money did you make? And so I I think it was like attracting a different audience. Um, Mm -hmm. But because I was coming from this like Udacity course that I never finish, (laughs) um, I like I literally stopped after the third week or whatever. And I started using TikTok. I never finished that course. And I stopped paying for it. I mean, fair enough. (laughs) Yeah. You learned what you needed to learn. Yeah. (laughs) And people were like signing up for my website and um, signing up for pre-registration or pre-ordering my games because I launched it in the beginning February uh, 2021. But yeah, but I I was more like focused on my audience of 
like boba like that was my original audience so but that's how it started interesting because that's basically what happened to me with tiktok that somebody was like you should get on there and i was like i don't want to that's another platform like it's too much work I, i've never used tiktok mm -hmm. and then i yeah and then i started and i got a ton of views and i was like damn i should have been on here for way longer do you have like your format you figured out like the ones that like guarantee work style of video or are you still like messing around a lot and experimenting um the this is the hard part it changes the algorithm changes there some things that used to work for me last year don't work as well now even though like i get on the for you page or whatever and people are completing the video i'm not really sure why i also like removed myself from it and it's mostly like artwork or whatever if i ever ever do like a trending sound and mention that I left Google <laughs> <laughs> to make to make games about Vova. Like it's literally just tons and tons of comments telling me how stupid I am. Wow. Nah, you made the right choice. I wouldn't want to work at Google. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty wild that people value working for a big company over pursuing what you actually want to do. I presume. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I um, I think people are coming from. It's just that Google has positioned themselves as being this like dream place to work. Yeah. Well, if I do want to go back, it's pretty easy too. And but I can't say I, I don't want to say that on a TikTok <laughs> or in TikTok <laughs> comments or whatever. I even have this idea for like down the line, screenshotting all of these things and even doing a TikTok of like me just like hanging out. And like just showing all of these things and then also showing like how successful the games are right mm -hmm. after. That's like a TikTok idea. I think that would probably do well. <laughs> yeah, that would probably do well. Shut the haters up for maybe two weeks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't happen often. I've only posted about it maybe two or three times. I noticed usually what works in like my genre of games is user input. So it's like what should i add next mm -hmm. i noticed that when i was looking at your tiktok earlier you're always asking people to make suggestions yeah even in like your early ones mm -hmm. those yeah when it's like what should i add or whatever literally any time there is a mushroom or a frog in <laughs> the video <laughs> or in the game, they, they go crazy or and the um the algorithm always like pushes it when it's those when it's those two things for some reason yeah i was noticing scrolling down i was like wow that mushroom went viral yeah they love mushrooms <laughs> okay i need to do mushroom frog games <laughs> let's have a mushroom and frog game john <laughs> the girl that's doing mail time she like her character it's like cottage cory she even said this on in a thread when she was just saying how she got successful on tiktok she doesn't even have new clips she just reuses the same <laughs> like few clips or whatever of this like cottage core game and they go viral like every time it's mustard dot soup oh i've seen that game yeah that one that one's really cool yeah delivering mail so cute <laughs> yeah i really i really like the the casual framing for like just doing a job sometimes in games like that mm -hmm. yeah i reused clips at the intros of my videos like pretty much every intro is the exact same and people were like stop reposting stuff i was like if you watch more than three seconds you'd see it was new mm -hmm. but it worked so it was like i was thinking like i totally could just repost videos and probably they'd still work well but i never tried it i didn't know if that was like allowed in the rules i think like not too often but i think it, it was in the holidays time or you know when they do like those year-end wrap-ups or whatever there's these questions that you can repost a video to answer these questions and then um the game developer on tiktok his name is dev seb um he like just suggest he said he was doing it and he got his views up a lot by uh, by reposting so um i'm not as opposed to reposting after dev seb did it you probably get this like all the time like with the google thing mm -hmm. like what is it like like working for like a super big company like google and then like doing your own indie thing like that switch what is that like i feel like the first thing that i noticed was the freedom mm. now um because google i mean it's like a big company there's processes and all that stuff and waking up and all that but i, I also quit during the pandemic um in 2020 I do miss being able to like talk to people 
Um, I miss the perks and, and all of that. But I feel like in game dev, the creative freedom is like the thing that I appreciate the most at Google. Unfortunately, not a lot of that. The challenges, in, uh, just even as an engineer, is very, very limiting. Oh, and also just like it takes so long to launch anything and um, to get your work out and all of that. And I feel like when you're working on enterprise stuff, the bureaucracy of that and being able to like, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I love like making things. I love launching things. Mm. I The ability to launch things quickly was so satisfying. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and just being able to like explore whatever you feel like um, and whatever is in your capabilities, just getting direct feedback from people like hundreds of millions of people use Google Docs. But the amount of work that I specifically did, like, I didn't do anything that pushed because I wasn't I wasn't on the team long enough and I was in ads prior to that and working on ad software. It's not that exciting. Like it's a bit draining, yeah. Yeah. What are you putting in the world? Like, like what? <laughs> what is? <laughs> like, like does this? How many are there? Good place points with this? Are there like why? Are, like why do I even have these like cool skills of coding? Uh, you know, like what is? <laughs> yeah. Like, you can, it's like you can create anything in the world with coding, and I'm gonna choose enterprise software <laughs> <laughs> yeah now i feel even though like the games that i make are about bubble tea it feels like it's a good thing that i'm making mm -hmm. or like it's um dopamine or yeah, it's, yeah. it makes people happy mm -hmm. or whatever without like the bad place points that come with it so did i get that right did you say that being at google as an engineer is less challenging than what you're doing now or or did i misunderstand <laughs> sorry i'm like i don't want to get in trouble for saying anything i would say oh, that the, the okay. differences no, course, no, no. <laughs> i just would say the differences <laughs> i would say that um being at google is definitely challenging there's plenty of very challenging engineering problems for sure i would say that the set of problems as a game developer are very different and way harder mm -hmm. in my opinion for when you have to think about like it's just very object oriented i feel like it requires way more thought and a lot less predictability right oh, that's interesting you know like that whole um engineering fun like you can't force someone to have fun there aren't formulas that are fun yeah you know and i feel like in tech there's just formulas for things that work and people are able to to figure out um and i don't mm -hmm. think that that's uh always the case that's why like big huge huge expert studios or whatever their games flop sometimes yeah. and, and and that's very exciting to me because i feel like in tech there's this predictability it's like if you throw enough money at it people it'll you'll figure like people will figure it yeah. out <laughs> yeah I, I think a lot of that comes from like game design is a design field yeah whereas software design really a lot of the time is is it, it is just more engineering focused mm -hmm. like in, in game design you're constantly thinking about designing your game to uh to actually make it like interesting and different to everything else around it whereas in software development oftentimes you're falling back on standardized patterns yeah yeah, I would say so. And then um, I also don't like that. I feel like all of these patterns should be broken sometimes too, and they're so boring. Mm -hmm. The strongly object-oriented nature of games is like very interesting to me because there's this shift um, happening with people are like switching their stacks to being less object-oriented languages. Hmm. But in games, it's like they mimic real-life objects. Oh. Mm -hmm. I have never thought about that, to be honest. I remember being so confused uh, for one of my college projects. I, I had to use Go and just being so confused oh, yeah. coming from primarily like object oriented game development background. Yeah. Trying to work out how to use that language was a nightmare for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I literally don't even know what it's like not doing object oriented. I just yeah. I have never <laughs> done it the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did it once in Pico 8 and it was really, it was a different way of thinking. Is that what PQ8 was? I, I did try PQ8 once and I hated it, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not object oriented. If you want to have like a bunch of, let's say, bullets spawning on the screen, you just have an array and you like define positions and then you would like loop through and draw bullets on the screen based on those 
positions in the array or something like that. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Or that's how I did it. I don't know if that's the correct way, but yeah. <laughs> I find it like kind of funny when um, the software engineering things try to trickle in into game development or like obviously with mm -hmm. bigger companies, they are trying these like design patterns that are popular in like software engineering, like reflection or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then no matter like people try it and then at the end of the day, like just doing regular like <laughs> Uh, you you can kind of be dumb too mm. with the way that you engineer things, which is kind of nice in um in game development. I found yeah, all that matters is that the end result is good. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like there's like any stuff that you learned specifically at Google that you still use like with games? It's maybe like unusual for game people to do or mm -hmm. um i would say maybe the processes i've been made fun of sometimes but like i still write i, I mean i don't know if everyone else does this but i write like design documents for myself mm -hmm. um i write like tech documents i write basically product like prds like uh, product requirements documents hmm. and it's mostly for my uh, like the artists that I work with too just so they understand yeah, yeah. like the motivation of like the game so they understand like um, and even what I'm doing that's basically it in terms of yeah none of the engineering stuff is kind of like <laughs> has trickled <laughs> over I feel like has anyone else here written design docs because I've like I'll like occasionally sketch out ideas, but usually I'm like, I don't know, I would describe it as like improv almost. I think you know my stance on this. I just like avoid documents as much as I can, yeah. which is probably the opposite of <laughs> what you're doing. But... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've, I've definitely done a few design docs for like pre-production for larger projects I've wanted to do and stuff. And I find it just sucks all of my motivation for an actual work of it. Like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what what I've been doing recently um, is I've been I've been trying to use like a, a custom wiki for my projects. So for for like story and and art elements and and how everything is connected together. Oh. I was showing this to Miz the other day. I use a program called Notion. Oh, that's cool. You can probably like publish the wiki publicly when you release the game. Yeah. Well. I don't know. One day I'd love to work on like a, a crafting based or, or like farming based sort of thing, mm -hmm. like a survival game or something. And and having wikis for those is so handy. So may, maybe there would be a way to like convert that to an in-game guide or something. Because that, that's like, I would love a version of Stardew Valley where I never have to open the wiki on my phone and I can just like <laughs> pop up the thing and search it on, on my Switch or whatever. <laughs> So, so that's definitely something I should look into because I th I think it's all basically uh, Markdown that Notion uses that should be easily transferable. Hopefully, <laughs> if I ever if I ever want to. Yeah, that's really cool. I was this question I was also gonna ask: Would you ever consider doing like the opposite, like going from the indie thing to working for like super big company like Google or something? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it once <laughs> i was like no what i would do is like if i ever got like notoriety as a as a game designer or whatever and a studio approached me being like would you direct this game i would totally do that i'd, I'd <laughs> like do that in a heartbeat for most studios i mean maybe not every studio but my plan would probably be to leave after that one project is done <laughs> you know I just remember doing scrums every day and being and all the meetings and I was like, mm, yeah, I don't want to do this. I, I like the small like one to two people thing where you can just be creative and make stuff. That's I yeah, know, I think it's more fun and interesting. I mean, personally, that's what I'd prefer. But I, I do like if I could ever get there myself in like a director role so I don't have to worry about a bunch of the day to day yeah. stuff. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to make little games with a few people over mm -hmm. short periods of time for the rest of my life if I can, you know. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's like I wanted to go into AAA when I got out of school, and then very luckily I didn't when I landed at night home. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of imagine it now. You know, I don't think I'll, I, I would, like, physically survive it because I wake up at, like, 11 every day now, and I couldn't <laughs> do earlier, if I'm being honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> my whole, like, design philosophy now is, like, avoiding everything, like, Jira and, like, all of that stuff and like the planning i guess i'm kind of scared of it or something it's like out of my comfort zone like i couldn't i don't think i could deal with it definitely like myself i've i've been working a lot this year on like getting my my personal schedule going and what i'm finding is i do a lot better when i just like only do five or six hours of work a day <laughs> and and i know 
I know that it's not actually like you probably only get five hours work done in, in an eight hour day at a at a triple A studio, but that's still like the time the time that you're not actually getting work done is still work. <laughs> and so I don't think I could actually physically withstand that. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same. Hey, Priya, how much like work do you get in a day typically? Um, so I only work maybe like two, three days a week. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, I mean, I guess like the, the motivation for my jump too is that like my family and my uh, my relationships, meaning like my friends and even like the relationship with my dog and myself has like mattered more. And so I've been like, trying to figure that schedule and all of that out first and then figure out how work can fit in between instead of what I've been used to it's like you work and you figure out how to how to work out how to how to cook how to fit family time in that and so I'm trying to do the opposite last year I took like a two-month break to just hang out with my uh, my grandparents and my uh, my parents or and like learn a language like learn my, the language my grandparents speak they speak english too but um i moved in with them in the pandemic too i work i don't know it depends i feel like there's no schedule and i should probably figure out a schedule because like sometimes i won't work for weeks at a time like at all or and then i'll work for th- like three weeks straight or a month straight with no breaks yeah i think that's kind of inevitable with like working for yourself as a creative like creativity comes in bursts and and droughts so and it's it's probably more natural just like to work that way i mean it's more in line i guess with being more true to yourself kind of in a way Mm -hmm. i guess yeah do you feel like you your output is like better and like more like working like this than you would just sticking to nine to five five days a week uh i would say yes um i think i I, like i can probably do a little bit more like like, i I know that i can and i've been trying actually um basically since february of this year um because it's april now um i've been trying to be a little bit more intentional because i was like oh do i want to like do i still want to do this do i want to like actually try and focus i would say yes in terms of when I measure productivity as like feeling like I got accomplished, like accomplished a lot at the end of the day regarding even like myself, because I feel like like I go like three weeks of just like straight working, but I didn't work out at all. I didn't cook at all. Like I was just like door dashing everything like that doesn't feel productive to me yeah. because like I'm risking my own health for like launching and I just don't want to do that. But I think I can figure out a four, a three, a four day work week. I don't want to. <laughs> I just started doing um, five hours a day, five days a week. And I just get up and I work first thing. And it's just nice. It's like, oh, I'm done at like 2.30. Mm-hmm. And then I can go cook and do whatever. And I've got like plenty of time. And I'm not going to, it's not going to like interfere with talking to friends or something. Because they all get off work at five or something. I should do that. I should work five days a week. I don't even consistently work the same days every week either. It's like I need to figure it out. I've been doing five days a week and like try to do five hours. So sometimes I feel like I'm forcing myself into it and it's like I don't really want to work that day. But it's like I just do it and then I feel like I haven't really been productive that day. But it's, you know, I don't know, I do work with two other people. So I kind of feel like I have to stick to the five thing because they're sticking to it, you know. Uh, so I, can't, I I haven't even like considered it even as an option. My current schedule is six hour days, four days a week because I like to have an extra day off. I I just like I like all of my free time to be in a chunk. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I'm I'm in the process of pursuing an ADHD diagnosis and getting myself to work certain days is very difficult. So sometimes I just say, well today's today's a lost cause. Let's focus on getting ready for tomorrow instead. And I, I find that really helps because I can shift whatever day of the week I take off around a bit to account for that. I feel that as well. I I feel like sometimes I feel like, oh, today's a lost cause, but then I still like kind of, you know, keep sitting there and keep like trying 
and then I just feel like shit by the end of the day instead of just being like, oh well, I give up, I'll go outside and like energize myself, you know? Yeah, <laughs> there's an art to not letting yourself feel bad about not working. I don't think the way the world works as it is particularly makes that easy. But the the other thing I do is I always make sure to take my weekends off because I, I like to have that that checkpoint of here's the two days where I'm definitely not working and no one can talk to me about work today if I don't want them to. <laughs> I've been thinking about maybe scheduling it in to just have like two months off during summer or something. I think that would be like just amazing just to be able to try that. Because I do also feel like if I don't work for a very long time, I feel like after a while it just you get like this feeling that you want to work and then you make like cooler stuff, you know, or I do like a game jam or whatever. I've I've been trying to work out how to like give myself holiday days properly because I'm 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 in the camp where I think everyone should have like at least two months a year off. Um, yeah. So I I need to start treating myself like that and in, in, intentionally saying no, you're off for this week. I've been I've been planning that maybe once I go part time, I might do instead of doing like three days a week, I'll just do like two weeks of working and two weeks of not work or something. I feel like the rest is definitely necessary, or that's the advice that I've gotten from other people too is like and part of why I take so much time off is um and I think when you're like doing game design um on top of things you can't you can't force it and like I always feel like I'm better after that like two weeks off or like a full week of just like chilling you know so I wanted to know if you think TikTok comments could be a better way to manage community discussions than discord so when I used TikTok, I think I responded to like five comments and kind okay. of ignored everyone. <laughs> and I also made a Discord and never use it, like ever. Mm-hmm. I just made it because people asked. The best discussion place for me was actually being Twitch because like I'll just be working on a game and then people will talk to me about the game and suggest things and I get interesting ideas and then they, I don't know, they'll talk to each other and then they talk. That's been like where I've had the best like community discussion actually, which was surprising. Mm-hmm. I feel like I go on Discord and people just post memes or advertise their own games and I'm like... Yeah, if I if I never have to do community <laughs> management again, I'll be so happy. I, I figure at some point I'll have to have, have some sort of community. I think I think the key to that is having having enough people in the community that are, are willing to help sustain the community that like it's not all on you to to maintain it but i mean I, I i have a lot of experience with discord and very little experience with uh tiktok comments um i guess yeah so i i, I can't really speak to tiktok but i can i can say that you really have to be certain that your game is going to have an audience if you're planning on starting a discord and you want to keep it active because otherwise you're just making a bunch of work for yourself to appease like maybe a hundred people max when yeah. you, you don't have the audience to like actually support a Discord. Mm-hmm. I feel like Discord also kind of only works when you're really engaged into it. You know, when you're really like active and it's like the thing you talk on every day and like that is so much work for 200 people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. TikTok comments kind of scare me because I'll see somebody leave a comment and then I like refresh the page and it has 30,000 likes. <laughs> <I'm> like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? Like most of the comments I get are either like, will the game be free or can you make the game free? Mm-hmm. This reminds me of this other game or that's that's about I it. See. I see. guess. Like I don't. Uh, Bria, you, you were saying about uh, asking people for su- suggestions for your games and tiktok videos do you find that tends to direct a discussion away from from things like oh this game's similar to that or whatever for sure um so i also go live on tiktok sometimes and i get some of the best ideas from the community through um going live because the same thing as streaming for the most part you know it's just uh, on tiktok i've just noticed um again i joined gaming in like 2020 and i have did not really have any background and didn't know about this um culture of creating a discord around your game um i have one for beta testers but that's it but it's gated like i have to give people an invitation to um to join it and there's like an application process but when asking about like different features asking for ideas um and even feedback and i've noticed that um having a tiktok has been a way where people were will instead of leaving me a bad review as a way of giving me feedback on um like the google play store or the ios app store they will instead um just give me just get comments on my videos so um that's easier for me 
that it like because I, I can see them and then it's just easier to like manage a discussion there and then it's more like I get to choose what to engage with and I've found in the other discords that I've been in that like there's almost like a sense of well if the person's not going to respond to me in this discord then I'm not going to participate like the the owner of this discord is not going to respond to me and the the feedback and the things that I want. That's really interesting about the user feedback. I, I I've only really released games on itch, so I don't, like. But the one time I did have a have a release on Steam, it was so exhausting looking at those comments because it's like, not only are they saying negative things about the game, but they're assuming it has to stay that way, and they're leaving a mark on the game that will yeah. negatively impact its visibility. Mm-hmm. I really don't think like Steam reviews are useful to like even gauge like the quality of a game yeah i think uh you're right that having somewhere very publicly that people can give feedback is is a really good idea uh i will say again that discord is probably too much work for that like like you were saying you have you have a discord for your uh playtesters or whatever i worked with a studio before where basically instead of having slack or whatever we just used a discord server and that's how i'm going about uh with my own studio as i'm hopefully getting that off the ground and i think like that's the best use of Discord is just using it for like tracking who's working on what and having having meetings and such because it it has all of the functionality that you'd want from that, and it's free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. I I just moved my team or I didn't I never use Slack. It was just like messaging them individually. <laughs> um. But I just moved everyone onto one single Discord and it's been so nice. We all know what we were working on and then um if I ever need to answer a question like hopping on voice really quick and not having to like worry about video and all of that like it's so nice oh yeah but i've just i felt i felt like with tiktok i would wonder if this is the same for youtube or whatever but it just feels like uh people are part of a community um because they do feel like their feedback is getting heard and all that stuff and i feel like it keeps my retention up too um so in mobile in mobile gaming Sometimes if you lose a player, they're gone forever. Like they're not going to come back to it. Um, But I feel like with TikTok, when I post a video about like a new feature or a bug fix or a thing like uh, the retention is a lot better. Um, So people re-engage. And so if I fix something that was wrong with the um, that was like messing up engagement before or like the game got boring and usually when a game gets boring, people like put it away forever and they will never find out that there's new stuff. Um, at least with TikTok, I can re-engage the players. Oh, that's really interesting. Have have either of you done mobile game Brogan or Adam? I have actually a few times. They were definitely not successful products or anything. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> Technically, like if and or I work I worked on um that was a mobile game. It was also a PC game and it wasn't it wasn't like a casual thing or anything or a t- time engagement sort of thing. For me, definitely still, like, mobile is just, like, it's really, it's just, like, a lot of work to get it on there, but it's really cool, because then I can, like, show it to people, like, hey, this is the video game I'm making, that's, I think, the coolest part. Yeah, anyone can try your game. Yeah, Uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's really interesting, because I'm just, like, mobile is a whole different space, and just hearing, like, the problems and challenges you face, like, oh, you want to keep engagement high, you want people to keep playing, that's interesting, because, like, Mm -hmm. with, like, Steam, it's just, like, oh... You just sell the game, and so I don't care if they play it or not. They already paid me, so it's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, too. I think it's definitely something completely different. Like, I once made one mobile game with Stuffed Wombat, and it was like, we had a thing where, like, the longer you play the game, the less ads you got. Mm-hmm. But it was more like, I guess, like a statement than actual business model. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I always just really appreciate when a game offers me, like, instead of doing all the microtransactions or sitting through ads, just a one-time purchase. I always really appreciate that. I like how you implemented ads in Boba Story. Thank you. How it's it's not just a bar at the bottom that's, like, just there being annoying or something. It's like, here, you can watch this and you get customers. It's like, oh, I want to do that and get a bunch of customers. It was like, that's nice. It's not, like, very intrusive. And then you can kind of role play in your head that that's you promoting your store, like on, I don't know, a billboard yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or yeah, yeah, it's just trying to get more people. It's like, yeah, you 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 pay a price and then you get a bunch of people. Um, it's been nice. That's kind of 
what's been helping too um because like in mobile gaming especially like uh, ones that are released by big publishers um you're just bombarded with ads and um the reason is um the value of customers is more for first time players like in ads because if you're reaching the same player over and over again um you're not as oh. the ads start getting worth less and less and that's when people usually re-engage the um that's when they try add like in-app purchases which i don't have yet so actually actually the business model of of showing less ads over time is not necessarily a bad one <laughs> yeah it's not it's not bad um i mean i do make a decent amount oh i mean i make all my money from um from ads but uh but i do use reward ads so those are the ones where you opt in you say hey i'm gonna watch this for like if it goes it ranges from like five seconds or 30 seconds or whatever um and then but those ones are typically worth the most. Mm -hmm. So I don't have like banners or anything like that. The reason why I like mobile is just because I play I play mobile games a lot. So um, that's just where I have the expertise, I guess. Or that's just, that's my wheelhouse. I've never I've only played one Steam game, and it was like this past year I played Unpacking. So I don't I don't want to go outside my wheelhouse, I guess, in terms of the games that I play. Yeah, that's probably how it is for us. Where we're all on Steam and <laughs> never did multiple. Yeah, you guys are on Steam. <laughs> I do still want to make a mobile game at one at some point, and I have I have like a prototype for one done. Um, and the 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 reason I guess I want to make that game is because the only games I enjoy on uh on mobile are like arc ar arcadey golf games. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I have this infinite golf game uh prototype that is absolutely addictive to play and like. I, it's not it's not even got any got any features so I, i'm i'm hoping to at some point uh, dedicate some time to releasing that still you should launch it yeah that's also what i like about mobile um the process of launching is like much less um it's not that big of a deal like launches i mean when you're a small team i guess they do matter but once you're bigger they matter less and less but mm -hmm. um like i guess the thing that i've learned the most is just to like push it out get people playing it get data as yeah. soon as possible mm -hmm. like throw in some type of i use firebase analytics i don't know if that's the best one um it's only it's just i've used it before so um yeah just getting data seeing if people like it uh, as soon as possible um because like barrier to entry is very small and um and ios specifically people don't really write reviews like that unless your game is like crashing so it's not really going to hurt you. And you can also, if you release a new update, you can erase all the old reviews too. Uh, what's the hardest part of designing a casual mobile game? Because I'm, I'm really curious about what, what you find the most difficult during that process. And, and my initial guess is it's probably just filling it up with content, right? Actually, okay, so uh, like the opposite. It's actually cutting things, in my opinion. Um, so my, uh, my game is a little bit like bigger in terms of the amount of things to do then I guess like a hyper casual or typical casual game it's like between casual and mid-core I would say um, and maybe even it is mid-core but um, I would say that cutting features is probably the hardest part because in mobile you probably don't want to invest too much time or energy in something people aren't going to play so focusing on just like the first 30 minutes experience is like that's the advice I've gotten from like many, many mentors in this space, like not adding things in the beginning, because I feel like when you're trying to create a good experience, you want to add more content, you want to add more features. Um, and even just trying to like, even if I have a lot of content from artists or whatever, like I have to still put it in um, and make it work. Usually, like most people will not to get to that content. Um, I remember with my first game, and it was just like not it wasn't like anything crazy. I remember talking to one of my mentors. He was like, why haven't you launched this yet? And this is my first game. 
I said, oh, I need to add like 100 more levels to it. And he was like, no, you don't. You have 20, like you have 25, like launch it now because you don't know if people are going to get past level five or whatever, like add analytics or whatever. You guys probably talk to other people too. Like when you're just yeah. like talking about those different ideas, people love to add more and more ideas. It's like, oh, have you thought of this? And it's like, of course I have. Like Feature creep. And yeah. This, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, of course I've thought of this. This happened. Like, this is all I think about all day, every day. You think I haven't thought of this thing that you thought of? Like, <laughs> <laughs> the first five minutes of thinking of this like of course i have somebody suggests something and it's like not a good idea and you're not sure how to tell them like why it wouldn't work <laughs> you don't want to be like well you see it's because your idea is terrible that's why i'm not gonna add. Yeah. <laughs> i've just like kind of just tried to zone out any comments that are just like positive it's like if they're positive they're like oh hell yeah you know and the rest i'll just like imagine they don't exist and my life has been better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Similarly, usually when someone has a complaint about one area of your game, you know that area is weak anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's not. It's not that I don't care about actual feedback. It's. It's just most of the comments are, are just bad takes. <laughs> yeah. Or it's like I, I'm gonna get to that. What do you want from me? Yeah. There's this um, business thing where it's like you d never hate your customer or whatever, and I feel like I, I like I don't. Um, but sometimes <laughs> the comments can get annoying, I could say. <laughs> it's like, especially when it's over and over and over again, it's like, I'm doing it. I've said, I'm, I'm working on it. I, I promise you, I know that. Um, but luckily, like in, in all of that, there are sometimes good, um, good mm -hmm. feedback. Oh, yeah. And, um, and like a bug that I didn't catch from any, none of my beta testers caught, which is nice. Yeah, it's, it's so many bugs on release i remember because it's just like suddenly a ton of new people are playing the game and then they're like oh here's this this doesn't work this doesn't work it's like <laughs> oh the, I mean, everything worked when i played it but it's just me so i can't find all the bugs um so do you guys play mobile games i i do uh, a, a few but i don't i don't really like play any that i'd regularly go back to are like as i said i was talking about like arcadey golf games i tend to prefer stuff that has like a quick gameplay loop like that mm -hmm. but recently i've actually been playing roller coaster tycoon on my phone which has been pretty fun because that's like easy enough to work with that interface for but my favorite my favorite game i've ever played on my phone is 80 days by inkle studios is that the traveling one yeah yeah so you're you're going around a map of the world and at each spot you're like making decisions about what to do in the town and how to how to proceed and stuff but it's it's like the story of around the world in 80 days except every time you play it it's different it's so cool so it has this unique thing where it's like reading a book and then when you get to the end of the book you feel oh the book's over it's so sad except this time it's not because you can just do a different route around the world and get a completely different story and so I, I think I've played like over 100 hours of that on my phone, probably. There's so many like really good indie games and stuff on mobile with like beautiful stories and stuff. But for some reason, like it doesn't like never grips me. And I always play like the the games that are like, oh, fill these vials with these colors. Or it's like place <laughs> these blocks in the right place. It's just like so brain smoothing that you, it's just, yeah. I don't know. I hate it at the same time, but it's like, mm -hmm. it, it wins me over. It's really, <laughs> and you know, it's also like designed by like data driven yeah. design, like the ultimate way to, to catch you in. But it's like, I hate that I fall for it, you know? <laughs> I think it's a matter of what people are actually playing mobile games for, which is often just to like tune out or chill out or have have on while they watch TV or something. Yeah. Which I, I still think my, my infinite golf game, which, uh, I will acknowledge is similar enough to uh, Desert Golf, which I've also played a lot of on my on my phone, which comes highly recommended for me. But my my, my game is more exploration focused than than level focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think this game would work well because it's just like your your only input is is hitting the golf ball, and occasionally there's a challenging hill to get up with or whatever. So it's very much the sort of thing where you can turn your brain off and you can play for ages. <laughs> I would love to even be able to come up with a game like that. So I think that it's really cool. Now is this game called Bacon and you literally just, it's like a thing of bacon that falls from the top of the phone. And then you, you basically just tap and you try to hit, like use a, um, a frying pan to like smack it onto different stuff. And it's an, it's an indie dev that, mm -hmm. that made it. And um, it's just like different stuff. Like it's like the picture of Mona Lisa. Right. It, it's like those games in general don't require that much 
effort. I, no, not effort. No, I think it does require effort. It's more like you don't have to do very heavy game design like you do with like crafting a mm-hmm. world, you know? Yeah. I think that that's kind of nice. And I, I guess what I like about mobile too is you can like, you can suck at it first <laughs> and like release. I've mm-hmm. felt like um, at least watching with different indie steam or console devs like you kind of have to have a very good game when you're done yeah if you want to release an an indie game on steam it has to be a good game on release unfortunately yeah imagine if like the comments on the apple store were like the steam comments i would (laughs) (laughs) three page essay with like a complete checklist have you seen the checklist reviewer it goes through and like graphics realistic it's not good <laughs> whatever it is. it's like i hate the checklist of views i feel like 90 percent of steam's ui is just facilitating mental warfare against developers <laughs> yeah <laughs> like have, have you guys seen the the curator that's like not a roguelike or whatever and, and it goes yeah. on ev- everything with a roguelike tag and it just like says oh this isn't a roguelike because it's not tile based or whatever and it's like oh my god get over yourself it's a marketing tactic <laughs> What I hate the most about the checklist one is it's always like uh, game length, uh, short, okay, and then 30 hours plus. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so, so this is how you, how you decide the quality of a game is how long it takes you to play. People play a game for a very long time and then it's like not recommended at all. <laughs> so, oh. I, but I don't know. I, it, it's hard because like the reviews that I see on like mobile or whatever, I'm like, oh, whatever. But like Steam reviews, I'm like, this would hurt my feelings. <laughs> like, Especially with the big red thumbs down right there. Not recommended. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they get personal as well. <laughs> this wasn't ready. I can't believe someone would release something like this. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I would take it personally. My favorite comment I've ever gotten it was on a negative review of my game on youtube somebody left a comment that said i always thought he was a mediocre game developer with an inflated ego happy to see i'm proven right (laughs) jesus guys why are they so angry i don't understand (laughs) do you think that having your internet or social following tied to the success of your game is like a, a good strategy in the long run i would say yeah because then you don't have to worry about anyone else. Like, are people going to, you know, are big YouTubers going to review my game? Are game journalists going to review it? You can just, it's all, you're doing everything. So you don't have to worry about if other people are going to like hop on and help it out. There's no middleman or anything Mm -hmm. to like engage with your, uh, the people who want to play your game. And it's more, I guess, individualistic, I guess. You have more control over Mm -hmm. what happens, who sees it that kind of thing and you're less dependent on others Mm -hmm. which i think is a good thing for for me i find it like very exhausting the idea of the personal brand or whatever i just Mm -hmm. i just want to be myself online and then have another account that's my brand or whatever which is what i'm working towards right now but uh yeah i just i can't see myself being like front and center tied to my games either because I like the idea of working with other people and allowing my games to be viewed as the output of a team as opposed to the output of an individual. Mm-hmm. Hideo Kojima doesn't do half of the work on his games, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then everyone associates the games with him. It's like, yeah. this was you. You personally did this. Like, who's Todd Howard also? Any Elder Scrolls or anything from him? Yeah. It's like, you did this. I definitely want to be more hands-on with like my marketing and stuff maybe for the next game or, or like, I should somehow pick it up for Sukwe. I just feel like I should make time for it, you know, I always mm-hmm. I always see it as like an afterthought, I guess, and it's like, shit, it shouldn't be mm-hmm. because this is the only way people will play my game. I usually do marketing first, but, or I guess it's like an approach I've been trying is to like get engagement and like see if pe- anyone will sign up even before I start writing code for it and just like uh, based on ideas because if people you aren't even interested in like the idea or whatever i'm not gonna put effort into it oh that's really smart yeah i kind of i kind of did that with my game amount thing i guess where it's like i don't make it like a full game until people go nuts over it i guess but it's oh yeah mm-hmm. with all the original demo or whatever yeah but it's interesting to like keep that up like even during development like before adding a mechanic like just doing like a mock-up for twitter or something or tiktok mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's really smart. The thing about like once you have a following, maintaining it's not super hard. It's like yeah. the building the original part is the hard part. But once you have it, then it's like you can just kind of keep it rolling with like minimal effort and you'll get like huge rewards back in terms of like players and monetization and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Is that true for YouTube too? Yeah. I mean, like now I don't have to like watch trends and see, okay, like I should make a video about this and I should do a comparison and I need to, you know, follow this and get, hopefully get a viral video and get more followers. Now I'm just like, all right, I got enough followers. Now I can just make videos about my games. I don't need to worry about it anymore. Yeah. Way less work. And then mm-hmm. way more people check it out and play it. And that, you know, results in so much more sales and it's so much, it's, yeah, it's worth it. I like when I see people like say they don't want to market their games, I'm like, but it's not that much work and you get so much in return for it. Yeah. It's worth it. Yeah. Personally, like myself being tied to my games the last like eight years as I've been making them and, and learning, I just like always hesitate to go too in on a lot of marketing talk because I actually want to be a person online through my Twitter account, but I also do need to market my games. So that's kind of why I really want to branch out into having separate accounts mm-hmm. and facing uh, and having having my like games public facing marketing be from more of a brand account than a personal account mm-hmm. but i do i do like i see a lot of that having your your personal brand be your games brand it does a lot to make people think about the human behind the game i guess and i kind of see i can, kind of see the advantage of that as well but i'm just too tired to be publicly perceived online anymore <laughs> it's not easy i luckily i, ha- I had um a little bit of experience with that with like my previous tech career um but it's like my twitter persona and my like b- like the boba bria persona on um on tiktok and like just in the games in general um are very very different and i'm happy about that um my t- my users don't for my game in general don't really exist on twitter that's just not where they consume or at least like when I got to yeah. know the kind of people that play um, like cute mobile games, they don't really, they're not really Twitter folks, especially if they're going on their phone to, um, yeah. to have a, to have a wholesome time. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not going on Twitter. <laughs> I don't think Twitter is particularly good for marketing anyway. Yeah. It's, go- it's good for testing the water, seeing if there's interest, seeing if a GIF will take off or whatever. But you're you're not going to get the same click through from Twitter, for example, as you would from TikTok or or YouTube or whatever. I don't think. Yeah, and I definitely agree. I think Twitter is is really better to be like, hey, I'm I'm like a game developer making games. I guess, boy, it's more like you know about the person. I suppose. Yeah, if that makes sense. I've yeah. been kind of Twitter. I'm just like I'm not promoting. This is where I talk to people and just have conversations and like meet yeah. other developers mostly. Yeah, meeting other developers. It's oh, I forgot the name of this guy's game. It's a mobile game, and one of the monetization strategies that he tried in his game, he put like a picture of him and his wife, and I think like their animal or something, saying like "Thanks for playing, whatever." If you want to like say thank you for playing this game, you can buy like this in-app purchase or whatever, oh. and he makes a good amount of money from that alone because it, it is like a free-to-play uh, mobile mm-hmm. game, I think. Yeah, and that's one of the in-app purchases is um, just saying, hey, thank you for making this game. Well, that's cool. I always like when there's there's like the friendly option. It's just like, yeah, here's a give me a tip or something, and then the people actually go for it. It's like, oh, that's cool. Like, yeah. people like <laughs> people like to give. I feel like a lot of time the expectation is that people are gonna pirate or like not give money if they can, and just like everything's treated as like some hardcore like business transaction. But then it's like there's these friendly environments too, where it's just like here you can have this, and if you want to give me money, give it, and then people do, and it's like whoa. I don't know. I think they got it right with shareware in the 90s, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I still think, like, if I could do, like, shareware titles like that, I would totally do it. In fact, I'm, I might look at it for some projects. Just the idea of being able to, like, play an actual chunk of the game, not just, like, a demo or whatever, before you pay for the full thing seems, like, really fun. And that's actually something I'm thinking about for... I recently released a puzzle game, part of uh, a thing called Indie Apocalypse, which is, is, like, a really, really cool scene project where, where they release one every month and it's got like eight games in it or something but i i I made this game uh catacomb creeper rebind edition which is actually an updated version of a game i made for uh your game jam mrs i'm thinking of putting it on mobile because it's it's only got like four directional inputs so that can be done with swiping or on screen buttons easily enough Uh 
And my plan is that at the, so I'll, I'll have the first level in it for free. And then the idea is maybe that I will have like a sequence of four different screens that show off the mechanics from the later levels. And then like, say, if you want to experience the full game, you can like pay this small amount or watch however many ads or whatever. I don't know. Try and try and make that appeal to just like, you've played this much of the game if you've enjoyed it and you think you're going to enjoy these mechanics, uh, maybe just pay for the full thing now mm -hmm. <laughs> but i don't know that's that's just like an, an idea i have that i might not even do a mobile release for that but i think it could be cool i think that's what he was saying that guy because it was also kind of like a puzzle game and i think that's what they did too is basically like the first however many and then it's like hey thank you for so much for playing here's me and my wife if you want more levels yeah. or it's like thank you so much for supporting whatever but it's it's an interesting strategy because like i talked to a lot of folks in the mobile gaming space um like just people who've been at publishers or like they've been in the industry for a long time and I think that they're kind of used to the things that work in free to play almost nothing involves like the developer behind the scenes because I mean these are people trying to make like huge you know top 100 yeah. grossing games yeah and not like people who are just trying to I mean I, I'm a person who's just trying to sustain myself and hopefully just or a, a very small studio it just seems like with this new era of it being tied to the person hopefully will get mm -hmm. people to pay more or that that's yeah. just been my experience with mobile i i don't know if like steam or anything is gonna turn towards like free-to-play models at all i really hope not <laughs> it's so much less to think about with a charge up front I actually did some research lately because I've been now that I've learned how to do like multiplayer games. I was wondering like how many like indie multiplayer games there are. It's like only four hundred or something on Steam. Oh wow! Really? Is that online multiplayer only? Online multiplayer with um oh free. But the ones that are, if you include the ones that are not free, it's only still like seven hundred or something. Right. Uh, like yeah. multiplayer online multiplayer games that have indie in, as their ta in their tags. So it's like interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's really weird how that's like it's not like a thing, but also just like the free to play model. I guess I guess not a lot of indies use it. Like, yeah, which is weird because I would think that like it's almost impossible these days to do a multiplayer game if it's not free. Well, if it's like single player with co op or something, then you could do that charge because then somebody can just play single player. Yeah, I suppose. And then it's like, oh, I can play with my friends. That's fun. I do think like free to play is is very big with. Uh triple a and, and and larger companies nowadays um especially like looking at stuff like the metaverse or whatever i hate buzzwords but uh <laughs> <laughs> you know like like that whole thing is going in the direction of you can experience this for free but you have to pay money to get a better experience which yeah too just i don't know that that sucks i just want to <laughs> like i wish i wish i could just pay for the game one time and get that better experience all the time consistently i, I am kind of drawn to the idea of doing a free-to-play thing just because it's like i kind of like the idea that people can just like download the game and play it but it is true that you have to put in all of the i guess you can call it predatory stuff to you know to get people to actually pay for your game i don't know it's 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 weird it's weird balance but i do think it's probably inevitable that steam games and any any people are going to start doing it well there's the whole um the race to the bottom you know where everyone keeps charging less and less money and i think that happened on mobile like 10 years ago where everyone charged less and less and then everything yeah. just became free because yeah that's like yeah what happens and now it's expected for your game to be free on mobile yeah exactly i i do i do agree it would be kind of a nightmare if that happened for um for not mobile as well but it's because yeah i don't know yeah i mean where where, where possible i'd like to push back against a rush to the bottom like that with my games yeah oh, that's why i overcharge for everything <laughs> <laughs> and then because i'm famous people still buy it <laughs> yeah this game's gonna be two hours long and i'm gonna charge 40 dollars for it hell yeah <laughs> as it should be charging a fair price for your game shouldn't be upsetting people do i remember correctly that spookware went down in price it did yeah, it did. And and it did it did better after that, which is like kind of depressing, but also like <laughs> yay for you. <laughs> it's it's whatever, you know, it's it's up to the XP's hands. I kinda let them do what they wanna do with it, you know. 
Man, the stuff you don't have to think about so much when you have a publisher is nice. <laughs> yeah, it is just nice not having to like think about it too much, to be honest. And then also like the when it does go bad, like the blame is not really on you, so you can say, "Oh, it was a publisher." <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah, that's one thing about having an internet following. If your game's not successful, everyone's gonna look at you and remember you as the reason it failed. <laughs> do you ever think when when like a game doesn't do well, like oh, it's because people hate me as a person because they because you're like <laughs> t your persona is tied to the game because of your following. <laughs> I never thought about that. I guess I'll start thinking that now. And that's um. <laughs> that's what they want you to think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've I've been making like tiny games for game jams for years, so I'm used to my games not doing well anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah. by, by virtue of them being like made in a weekend yeah i still remember going like wild when my game had like 30 downloads so it's like hell yeah i <laughs> yeah. made it on itch you know <laughs> now that i've been a part of the haunted ps1 demo disc it still dominates my analytics on itch over everything else i've ever released to this day like every day uh, yeah both of those are massive in the like bar chart and maybe once once every so often there will be one of my other games up there. I don't know, it's, it's just like mind-blowing seeing how big it can get compared to how big smaller things are. Uh, my question was going to be, how did you all build your followings? Because I feel like we've all gone in completely different areas mm -hmm. of like the internet to like where people started following us and playing our games and like the influences I guess we've had. Um, but that was interesting that you were talking about Udacity and like watching some courses and stuff. Like how much... I guess, study did you do before going into TikTok? Two weeks. Two weeks of study. <laughs> it, it was... Yeah. But I was also, um, like, with marketing and stuff, I think the, the content, a lot of the content of the course was, like, from 2017, and I was like... Oh, yeah this is not relevant like this is not relevant at <laughs> all um like things shift so much yeah i mean i've been lucky to at least have a like, an okay following on twitter instagram is not a place that converts for me at all and i wish i could undo my following but it's where all my family is too Ugh. so i wish i could undo mm. that one but i'm just hoping i will lose followers over time maybe i should say something that they will hate <laughs> um so that i can lose followers tiktok i feel like just happened out of nowhere and that or not out of nowhere but like it was consistent i think within the first month i hit like ten thousand, um and then just keep going and then like really nailing the art style because the art style i had before was more of like a hilda like adventure time ish art style but i kind of wanted to like go more kawaii just to really narrow in on um what i think and like kind of ghibli a little bit too people go crazy over art uh, and i've noticed a lot of game devs sometimes will start getting into the nitty-gritty of like game dev stuff i'm like that's a great way to attract more game devs yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and people you know sometimes ask like how to make a game and I, di I did that in the beginning too but i have a lot of background though in um, product management and um, startups. I was an advisor to a lot of different startups. So like really getting to know who my customer is and what they like and like talking to them and seeing what their everyday life is like and like an understanding what verticals even that are somewhat interesting to them and making sure that they cross has been very mm -hmm. has been successful for me, um, even with features. I, I, I guess this isn't answering the exact question. But I just did want to say that having this following did also help my app store optimization yeah. too. And now the majority of my players are not from TikTok. Oh, cool. But yeah, so but it helped to boost it mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. app stores and Google stores and, and YouTube because people were posting like fan videos and stuff on YouTube and that like boosted. Oh, also, I get more conversions to downloads than followers that i get on tiktok <laughs> and, or on any platform people will download my game before following me on tiktok isn't that wild wow. <laughs> that is that is insane yeah does follower account even matter on tiktok no <laughs> not at all because yeah. ev everyone browses like the for you page right which is just what the algorithm recommends mm -hmm. yeah my first video was like a million views in a day and I, with no outside promotion, I was like, what is this? This is like, mm. what, <laughs> like, this is crazy that this can happen. Like, like all that, it like basically surpassed my YouTube in like no time. 
and, mm-hmm. I'm, and like a week i was like why am i even doing youtube <laughs> i felt like it yeah was <laughs> but i guess it was useful for learning how to make videos and stuff but like yeah it's just it's crazy the algorithm every time we record an episode i'm just like god i really need to make a tiktok and then i forget until the <laughs> next episode <laughs> <laughs> i actually have a plan that I, I might actually make a tiktok talking about because uh as we're recording tomorrow is uh results announcements for ludum dare so i kind of want to oh. do like a reaction to my results and like show a bit of gameplay and stuff because I, th- I think that could be a, a cool TikTok. Mm. I'm starting to actually get ideas for TikTok during this episode. So hopefully hopefully I actually get some movement on, yeah. on doing that. I like that like with TikTok, you can keep trying. Um, mm-hmm. Like you can make different versions of the same video because not like for the most part, your followers will not see all of them. Yeah. Like sometimes yeah. they will, but um, but very, very rarely they will. Um, so usually they're pushed out to different people each time, which is nice. So you can like just keep tweaking and working on it. Uh, Mrs. You make YouTube videos. So I'm guessing the barrier to entry for TikTok was just like wild to experience. Yeah. <laughs> Spend 30 minutes <laughs> making like a 30 second video and then that translates <laughs> to 5,000 wish lists. So I was like, what? Yeah. The amount of effort needed for TikTok is so low. <laughs> That it'll probably Damn. go up, I guess, as more game developers get on there and it gets more saturated. Yeah. So I guess like now is the time to build. But of course, if you build a following, that kind of the more of a following you have, the more immune you get to like changes and stuff because people are following mm-hmm. for you and will mm-hmm. go out of their way yeah. to see you because they know you and have been following you for a while. Yeah, you know, the barrier entry is so low with YouTube. It was like years like of work <laughs> to like slowly build up, and then with this, it's just like. You're in. You can already, you just do stuff and it's like people engage with it. You just have to be good. You don't have to think about title and thumbnail. You don't have to think about any of that stuff. You just make good videos and then, or show interesting things and it works. If you were to do it all over again, would you do YouTube? Maybe, probably. I mean, the the person who got me into TikTok, he was like wanting to get into YouTube mm-hmm. and he was like asking me for advice and he was like, let me give, I'll give you some tips on TikTok. And so we kind of swapped and I was thinking, okay, so even though he's big and successful on TikTok, he still wants to do YouTube. So I, w- I would probably feel like that too. I'd see other YouTubers and be like, um, I, yeah, let's try that also. It was definitely a good learning experience though going on YouTube because it was like, I don't know, I learned how to make good videos and stuff that have, and it's definitely translated over to TikTok a lot. But the effort is so much more. I don't know, I've heard people say the the people who follow you on YouTube are much more like committed followers and they'll watch everything you do and like buy everything you do. And I think that is true because like before I finished my game, I sold courses and like I, I have like four courses now. And I'm pretty sure people who buy one tend to buy all of them. So it's like good in the de- development stages when you don't have much to show mm-hmm. as a way to monetize. I don't think I could like promote a course on TikTok like that. Like I couldn't, the average TikTok viewer would, I don't know. They're more looking for games. I don't know, I haven't promoted though the courses, so I don't know. But I don't know, YouTube, you can do longer form content and you can promote more things. Like, oh yeah, because in my devlogs, I would be like, okay, here's my courses, here's my Patreon, here's my Twitch. And, you know, here's the steam. I could list off like five things and people would go to every one of them and like, you know, back my Patreon and buy my courses and wishlist the game and all that stuff. So it was like, I guess you can do more stuff in a video and mention more things and people will engage with all of them. Whereas a TikTok with one video, you can only, you got to keep it to the point, short attention span, like here's the one thing, Yeah. you know. I don't actually have a particularly functional following not much it's primarily actually on itch.io also twitter which uh, as we've discussed doesn't exactly convert to plays when i started making games there was this big idea of alt games it was like a big hashtag at the time it was just like game games that were outside of the norm and and like walking simulators and such and i kind of came up through that because making making a walking simulator as an as, as a beginner dev is a really interesting experience because it lets you do a lot of environment art and a lot of level design work without actually having to uh put gameplay in necessarily and i think so many cool developers i found through that and and who've gone on to do uh, really cool things like a, f- a few weeks back i mentioned uh the game wide ocean big jacket i've known those people since like 2016 i think just because of existing on itch.io and existing around game developers on on twitter for a long time and i think the one 
cool thing that I've noticed with Twitter is that following a lot of other game developers has exposed me to a lot more experimental work like that mm -hmm. because the the people who are playing and talking about experimental games aren't the core audience for most games. They're usually actually like other game developers or artists who've been getting into game development. And so you'll see a lot of that if you follow a lot of like, uh, especially queer uh, game developers just uh, and, and like marginalized game developers, you'll see a lot of a lot of more exper experimental work. And I think that's really interesting. Like, I think I, d I don't think there's enough value put on on, on those sorts of games anymore. I feel like uh, I'm I'm glad I got to experience a bit of bit of that in in terms of growing my following uh, as I posted on Twitter and and didn't know what I was doing and and just like over time existed there and eventually I started Haunted PS One which kind of grew my following a lot more I don't know I, I look at like how how big the Haunted PS One is and how big my my stuff is and I still like know that the Haunted PS One spreads attention between developers which is really good because it 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 brings more marginalized voices up to the level of me or, or are my peers but it it also wasn't like a massive following gaining thing for me or anything like that how did haunted ps1 grow so it kind of was small and i intended it to stay small but then people as they do as, as artists do they have a tendency to want to work together you know and so a lot of people uh a lot of people kept like pushing for some sort of a collaborative game and and i kept being like turning it down because i didn't want the the community to become focused on on one project or everyone to be doing free labor for a game that it was really infeasible to charge for or whatever. And so we ended up doing the demo disc, which massively grew and, and we were not prepared for that. And, and like, personally, I'm still exhausted from the rate of growth that the 100 PS1 had for a while there years later so it, it was interesting and, and i'm glad i i get to be a part of that but also i'm glad i'm taking some time away from it this year as well you're not like the face of it so it's okay for you to kind of like step back i guess also yeah i'm, I'm just some rando who started a, a, a discord server <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely it's true, though, because I, I think, you know, I'm pretty grateful for the hearted PS1, because I think most of my following comes from No Players Online, to be honest, which is, you know, a game I did for Haunted PS1 Jam, so, you know, it all works out in the end. But yeah, for me, it's also kind of, I guess, similar, I think most of my following is also just Twitter and Itch. It's mostly, I think, just because doing all of, like, the, the small games I had, like, a lot of opportunities every time one of those released. There was, like, a chance that maybe, like, Markiplier or, some, or someone, like, would play them. Every time that happened, like, it would boost my following up a little bit, you know? Until, you know, like, I think ultimately with No Players Online, I think most of the following... It's still getting 300 downloads a day, which I don't understand. I don't know, I really should start doing a TikTok because I feel like I've been kind of abandoning my Twitter a little bit or like any marketing things ever since I started doing Spookware because I don't, I, I guess I don't have to do it anymore or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing and, and they've been really interesting, like the dev diaries for, for Dread XP on, on their channel. And I mean, that's marketing work that you're doing. Yeah, exactly. It shows true that you actually, uh, you and your team actually have a talent for like, creating engaging content even when you're just talking over development <laughs> yeah i'm I'm really happy of those devlogs they don't like perform well at all which is sad but it's like yeah it's good to have the practice and to like do little videos uh which is really cool yeah yeah i, I can give you my formulas for tiktok if you want to just copy what i do <laughs> <laughs> i should just i just added it to my to-do list make a tiktok I'm, I'm gonna finally do it i'm just gonna do something i don't know to like spookware or something and then uh, i'll get three million views and be rich or whatever <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's how it works i've made maybe like a couple hundred bucks like it's not monetization is very oh very yeah bad. <laughs> it's, it's worse than youtube maybe a future podcast episode we can do reporting back on our experiments with tiktok <laughs> yeah <laughs> someone just sent me a message he asked me what my take is on people making a Roblox version of No Players Online. <laughs> and my take is still, like, hell yeah. I'm glad they did, because that game got, like, 50 million plays or something. So it only helped me, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> oh, Roblox. Roblox version. <laughs> So you mean you mean to tell me you're benefiting off of the exploitation of ten year old game developers? I am, honestly, yeah. <laughs> Actually more more people play the Roblox version than Spookware by like a what? huge margin. So 
in in any sense, the Roblox version of No Plans Line is the official one, you know. <laughs> 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 well, now that you've said it, it definitely is. <laughs> I d- I do see sometimes like TikToks about No Plans Line, and then like everyone in the comments is like, um, but th- th- I saw this from Roblox, and then everyone else is like replying to that like, <laughs> oh, but the original one is much better. So I'm like, hell yeah, <laughs> this the, the scores I need. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> What do you think the future of Apple Arcade type gaming will be? Because I know Netflix is also doing their own version of it where it's like included with your Netflix subscription. Um, If you log in with your Netflix subscription to the games that they're launching or or partnered with, um, even though it's a paid game or they have in-app purchases or something like that, you get it all for free with your Netflix subscription. So yeah, I I wanted to know what y'all thought about that. That's like, it's basically subscription-based games. There's not going to be any monetization in the games. You just pay the subscription, you get the game for free. Yep. I think that's really cool. Like, Xbox do that, was it? Yeah, yeah, they have Game Pass. I had PC Game Pass for a while, and it is really cool. If I ever got an Xbox, I would totally sign up for it again, because, like, not only can you play Xbox games day one, you can also share your progress and saves between the Xbox and PC. I think that, like... I don't know, Xbox are making a lot of very wise business decisions, even though they might be uh, facilitating some monopolistic behavior. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I believe that, like, Apple Arcade is also a similar subscription service to the Xbox One, so I I, I can talk about about the Xbox One, but not not Apple's, because I I think the last time I touched an Apple product was four years ago, maybe? (laughs) Oh, damn. Here I am with my iPhone and Apple Watch and (laughs) MacBook and iPad sitting (laughs) right (laughs) <laughs> With Apple Pencil on it. <laughs> I need to get an Apple just just to debug stuff at some point. Because apparently my Apple exports have a lot of issues that are unique to Apple. But I'm like, I don't know. Is it worth it for like 5% of my players to get it mm-hmm. debug and all that extra work? I don't know. But then I could release mobile games on Apple. Salmon's in the chat and said, Apple is going out of their way to make sub-based stuff nearly impossible if it's stored locally. Like subscription services are moving towards game streaming and you not actually having the data of the game stored locally on your device. Oh, like cloud gaming. Yeah, so like cloud gaming and, and streaming. So you can't store like the game data locally, you have to store it through the cloud. Yeah. I feel like, or at least with my audience, one of the, because I've thought about, you know, having some type of like, uh, there are a lot of mobile games that you literally have to have an internet connection to uh, to play. Like the feedback that I get a lot or with from players is how much they love that they can play it without um, without an internet connection. One of my ads, like my most profitable ad, um, actually works. I mean, this is a secret, but I was more optimizing for like I'm still learning. But one of my ads actually like the action still works if you just turn your phone on airplane mode yeah. so you can like not watch the ad. that um it, oh, okay cool yeah <laughs> I, fi- sure I mean i'm fine with it. people fighting oh no 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 it's um, fine like uh, i'm well aware of it but i'm like uh you know um if people yeah. like i don't make make money from from that but i, I would rather at at the point of or the stage that I'm at right now, I, I, I'd i rather maintain the player than um, make them upset. Um, and that's why I don't have in-app purchases yet either. Or it depends on who the audience is. You know, if you're going for a mid-core to a hardcore gamer, they're probably going to be more fine with, with that. Hyper-casual to casual to mid-core are probably going to want, you know, offline play, in my opinion. I think the corporations, maybe trusting them it might not be a good idea in the long run for creatives, because mm-hmm. like that's already happened with, say, Spotify, where like those artists aren't making any money off of yeah. that, and like mm-hmm. I do think that, especially Game Pass, like I previously mentioned, I'm pretty sure that's operating at a loss right now. I presume their plan there is to make it so it's profitable eventually. The way it will be profitable is that it will pay developers less, is what I'm scared of. Yeah. I just really, I just hope it doesn't get to like the Spotify thing. That would suck. Yeah. I mean, it's Apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other thing I would hope with subscription gaming services is that they don't become like people's primary method of consuming games. That people like will still buy a game if it comes out at full price. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do think that that's how it serves right now. It serves as an addition to your regular gaming like budget or whatever. Or if you don't have a have a big budget for for buying games, some people do just use 
use their subscription primarily. And I, I think it's interesting to think about like who's benefiting now and who will be benefiting in 10 years time. There's a lot to it that's like very scary as well as being very exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how like with music, it's not acceptable to just like sell your music online. You, you have to go through streaming services also. If you're not like on Spotify, no one's going to listen to you. Yeah. With the game, you're not doing that. It's like you can still sell games. It's a different kind of culture same with movies you can't sell a movie online anymore it has to be through like a subscription service or something youtube sure try to <laughs> every time i go on youtube you're like <laughs> oh, buy a true. movie from us and it's like <laughs> okay but what streaming service is this on alongside a bunch of other movies you know yeah it's like you're trying to get me by to buy marvel movies when i could sign up for disney plus and watch all the marvel movies in a month if i wanted brain damage oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one thing when i was selling courses i specifically avoided subscription services because i didn't think i would make as much money because it's like okay if somebody spends 15 dollars a month and they get access to all the co courses on this site and one of the courses they watch this month is mine i'm only getting a cut of that 15 dollars and it's going to be spread out amongst all the courses they bought. Whereas if I just have a course and I sell it up front, which is what Udemy allows. I think that's Udemy is like the only place where you can sell courses up front. And so I went with Udemy and because it's just like, here's a flat fee, you know, 12, 20 bucks or whatever. And then they pay it and I get all the money because Udemy is also cool. If you use your own referral code and you promote your course, you get the entire, like all of the revenue. There's no cut for them except for like three percent for like credit card fees or something so it was just like mm -hmm. i liked having that solid thing i sell it i get all the money it's i don't have to worry about you know being divided up between a subscription or anything like that mm -hmm. and also if people don't actually do the course i still get the money <laughs> it's like they buy it and they're like i'm gonna do this and then they don't it doesn't matter to me yeah i don't care if people make their way through it or not it's an interesting uh solution because free to play obviously is not an ideal form of creating games nor like consuming games. Just not a lot of people buy games at all, uh, or at least on on mobile. But I will say since getting Apple Arcade, I get access to a bunch of really amazing games. But I feel like even though they are these super amazing games, because I don't have that incentive to play them because I am technically getting it with a subscription, I just like I don't finish any of them and I mm -hmm. don't really play it. Um, I, I would say I play the games that I bought or free games more than the Apple Arcade ones. But like, I mean, I got access to Night in the Woods from Apple Arcade, which is which is nice. But yeah, I'm not that incentivized to, to finish playing them. I do think it's cool how like subscription services can better facilitate games like say unpacking or uh more emotionally and artistically driven games seem to do better on subscription services i think that's an interesting thing where people will subscribe to play like two hour long story games or whatever with the xbox game pass you're getting like every halo game ever or whatever so i mean there is that, that side of things as well i think my ideal world i'd be able to just release my games for free and still support myself it's weird to have to think about making design decisions based on what would be more profitable mm -hmm. i do think that subscription services can push back against that a bit because more of a captive audience and uh experiments can get through that a lot better because there's already the thousand or probably millions of people who have Game Pass or whatever uh, as an audience there for your game. And it's going to get like a, a, a spot on the front page on launch day mm -hmm. and, and launch week or whatever. I think there's there's definitely benefits to that. And one thing I do like about Xbox Game Pass or, or Microsoft's Game Pass is that they phase out items. And so they'll have like a, a section where it's this game is leaving ah. throughout your time on their service. You get like visibility at the start and visibility at the end and obviously in between the amount it's recommended to players is algorithmic so obviously based on how well a game does it's it's a lot more about players taking a chance on your game which is a lot easier mm -hmm. uh, it probably leads to more um like like when you were talking about earlier with like experimental i mean i, I mean well apple arcade requires like a certain studio size and like their contracts i mean it's under nda i don't know about them it's mostly just guesses from watching they have to be of a certain quality and finish and all that stuff but i would hope that there is more room for more like experimental 
like deep story, even like more visual novel-y type games of storytelling. But that's not what I'm seeing yet. I think actually that's a cool idea. Like a, a subscription service for visual novels seems like it would actually be a, a pretty good service for people who like those games. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know too much about the business of that. But it, it seems like I've, see, I've seen a few examples actually of this where there's systems to make a text-based game where through the same app or whatever you can sell it as well, which I think is actually quite interesting. A bit, a bit like Roblox, but maybe less exploitative. Yeah. Could be a really cool way to go with like a subscription service or that sort of thing. Does episodes have that where you can pay for other people's? Yeah, that I think I think episodes is what I'm I'm thinking of. I haven't looked into it too much. Just like off the top of my head, that I think that's a really cool application of subscription services for games is facilitating small artists to profit off of smaller games but i do think that in places where that happens it then creates a different expectation for what uh, a game within the subscription service will be mm -hmm. it might actually impact the small creators visions for their games and and lead to a, a bit of like pandering to the market more than actually making the game you wanted to make which is why you would use a small tool in the first place yeah I, this is like kind of going off of what um you guys were saying earlier in free to play or at least like from talking to different people the idea of just kind of making a game for the users that you want and like the experience that you want is just like not a thing that people even encourage it's yeah it's still all about like you know money at the end of the day and i feel like that probably plays into apple arcade and eventually like whatever subscription model gaming thing in the future is just how much money that they can make from it which sucks boba story right now is like pretty popular in southeast asia but it's not necessarily like the most profitable i guess i'm like well but they really like my game, so why <laughs> don't? <laughs> like, um, so what? Like, what do you want from me? I'm like, I'm supposed to just ignore them. So it, it's just, it's a very interesting conversation. If there are people who love your game, why, why don't you continue to make stuff that they will like? I think the one thing that gives me hope for like monetization in games is is itch.io because like time and time again they have shown that they actually do care about the creators over profit a lot of the time. They let you not give them any cut of your profits if you want to as well, which is like an insane thing for a company to yeah. do. If if say if that was proposed to Steam, they would like <laughs> it, they would freak out. Itch itch is still going. Itch is still growing. Their audience is growing and like I don't know, it just seems like maybe that could be a viable platform to replace Steam someday, because if Itch was as big as Steam, I would absolutely never use Steam again. Yeah, I'd like to see Itch grow more. I also like, they, they do have that it, the tip option that pops up when you download free games. And people use that and give you tips, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. You, even on paid games, people can, can give a tip, which is like really nice because it allows people who who want to give you more money than you're charging for your game to give you more money than you're charging for your game you know i've played maybe like two or three itch games before so i'm not like super familiar with the platform but what has drawn me there are like the creators that do put stuff on there are any of you familiar with npc kc they do a lot of stories with like trans characters i think i've seen stuff like best buy i've never played one of their games uh so. i i found out about them because uh, they do a lot of like very inclusive storytelling type games on android but then i saw that uh, they started posting stuff on um on itch but i i, I don't know i ha i just find it like very creator friendly but i don't know about how many users that are not like interested in also making games that know about it yet because I don't hear a, a lot of um, regular users from mobile or whatever that also are like consumers of, of itch unless they jump to it like me from like a creator that posts on both. I just like paying attention to creators that have very similar audiences as me so where it's like you know cute art wholesome story inclusive characters the whole or I guess like wholesome content. That that's sort of well, I I don't I don't know. I kind of hesitate at the wholesome games thing because there's there's valid criticism and and concrete examples of people using that to like 
hide the fact that they they've been like super abusive behind but at the same time i don't think letting that poison your view of all games that uh express themselves as being wholesome is is a good idea wait what is that i haven't heard that before what what, it, what is the so it's it's kind of the idea that there there was one example of like a developer of a very popular wholesome game uh i, I won't go into too many details on here but like having been like called out by the person who used to be like brand development person this person is actually really horrible and they were really manipulative to me and this whole persona that they're putting forward is uh super wholesome i built that for them the idea that it's very easy to hide behind a wholesome facade oh the the one thing like i want to make cute games and i want to make games with inclusive characters and i want to make games that might be considered wholesome but i also kind of do still want to reflect a a genuine human angle in things and and humanize the characters in those games because i think that's really important to not just focus on everything's wholesome but to also be like these are people and even though things are wholesome there's still issues and there's there's still negativity in their worlds and i mean obviously that's not what everyone plays a wholesome game for but i do (laughs) think that you you can approach that in a wholesome way in some ways Mm -hmm. like a like a spirit fair type situation yeah yeah stuff like that okay but i like i do think that there is a lot of focus on our game so wholesome look at us we're making a game that's cute and wholesome and you don't have to worry about anything while you're playing it and i i think sometimes that can also be very overwhelming (laughs) There's an importance to keeping it real, even if you are making content that you would describe as wholesome. Mm -hmm. Personally, I would like to show through my art that, like, I genuinely care about people and such. I would hope that other developers would focus on that as well, because I don't know. A lot of times I see a game that's marketed as wholesome and it just feels empty in a way. Mm -hmm. And I do think, like, games need grit to have pacing and games need grit to have some sort of an engagement. And, and I think there there's like a balance you can strike where, where a game still is low stakes, but does have, have moments of pushback against the player. Like a, an example I've seen uh, talked about somewhere recently was like how Animal Crossing New Horizons, it isn't just like you decide you want to do the thing and you do it. It requires effort and time to actually do things in that game. And that actually makes things more meaningful as well. I don't know much about like wholesome games in general i haven't like followed i guess stardew valley i don't know if stardew valley counts but there's definitely some conflict in that game <laughs> in the characters and stuff i just remember whenever i hear wholesome games i think of the twitter account because oh, yeah. i know the people who started the twitter account because when i graduated where I'd, i went to this middle of the nowhere city for my job and there was a local game to have seen it was run by the people who run this account so it's just like, oh, I know I know the people behind that. <laughs> and I know the behind the scenes. And I just remember I'm like kind of lamenting how, yeah, people now specifically try to design their games to get featured on the Twitter account. And it's kind of like not, it's kind of takes the fun out of it now. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a bit like the can you pet the dog thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it, it's not as fun when people are specifically going for it it used to be like this unique like niche thing yeah and it was like we're featuring these interesting things and then yeah sometimes when it feels like a calculated decision for marketing purposes or whatever it kind of uh undermines everything Mm -hmm. (laughs) i mean obviously you do have to make calculated decisions for marketing purposes that's a hard thing to do but it's it's important to do that (laughs) Yeah, it's been um, quite a journey learning about game development or whatever, because like I joined in the pandemic, so I didn't get to participate in like meeting people or anything. So I feel like I'm not just now starting to learn about like because everything's just been in a bubble of like my room, like I, I make everything in my room. So and like with the very few people that I've met through TikTok or something like that's it. So I do relate because outside of those like couple meetings I went to, I've like never been around a game dev community. And I think most of that has come just from like everyone I know came. I made friends with through like YouTube and like Twitter, all the game developers. I know. I mean, like that's kind of the reason I started a podcast was just so I could like meet and hang out with other devs 
just like a good excuse <laughs> to make friends basically <laughs> that's why i started haunted ps1 in the first place was like there didn't seem to be any community like talking about these games that a lot of people were starting to make being the person who started it was exhausting but the fact that it exists now is awesome i don't know i i grew up in like the middle of nowhere in ireland and surrounded by empty fields basically our fields full of cows sometimes but um yeah me meeting game developers online has been most i i did actually go to to GDC in 2016 and I think I still regularly talk to maybe two of the people I met there. Mm. <laughs> I think online is like easier to meet people but unfortunately you do feel like like I would love to go hang out with some game developers in real life. Yeah. Can't do that yet. I got COVID at GDC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. So> <laughs> I, got, I met Jabril's at, at GDC and so that's how I guess I got here. Yeah yeah because he tagged me in a, a tweet you were asking about something. I'm yeah, sure and that was right there. after, like, we had those, like, a few days after we had met, so. But, like, yeah, GGC was the first time um, meeting people in person, and then um, it was really cool. The talks were really cool, and, like, it's very, very different than my previous tech life, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Because it's not that different in terms of, like, the work that much. The people there, the discussions, and even just the motivations are opposite motivations are completely opposite very interesting it's basically a, a bunch of people just you know trying to play and have fun or and facilitate other people playing and have fun which is instead of like i don't know ads and businesses or something yeah well, that still trickles in at gdc unfortunately <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> there's a lot of crypto there i was like oh, oh my god. god yeah oh my god the crypto people seem to be the only people who are willing to go and chance getting covid and, and do like big big uh boots and stuff what i heard of like the indie spaces at gdc were, was that they were like super empty and sparse Mm -hmm. they were the number of booths was was really low which is sad that is back to the following having an internet following you can make whatever you want because you don't have to worry about marketing to pages like this and getting promoted on them being famous fixes all your problems <laughs> <laughs> famous famous person mrs is, is, yeah, is. extremely famous <laughs> mrs is, is, is makes games <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming on, Bria. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Do you have anything you want to promote? Sure. Boba Story is a mobile game about Boba. It's on uh, iOS and Android, and it is free. And yeah, play that. Um, and if you want to follow me on TikTok, my TikTok is Boba Bria. You don't have to follow me anywhere else. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't really care about the followings anywhere else. Um, All right, cool. Powerful. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah, that was. Really yeah, fun. yeah, it was a really interesting discussion. I'll see you all. Goodbye.